All right. Well, today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Kate Ruskin, who is a lecturer in ecology and environmental sciences, who is going to be giving a talk as part of the process of affiliating with the Climate Change Institute. Her talk is titled Here and Back Again, Path of an Evolving Conservation Ecologist. I just, for those of you who are regular attendees at Born Symposium noontime Zooms, I just wanna remind you that I don't summarize the talks in my usual way for those seeking affiliation or for outside speakers. I only subject Institute members to that. And with that, Kate, it's all yours. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so I'll just share my slides. Hopefully you can see, you nods hopefully. Um, anyway, thank you for having me today um, and um, entertaining the possibility of affiliating with CCI for me. Um, this would be my second time because uh, 10 years ago, I joined the University of Maine as a PhD student, also in ecology and environmental sciences with uh, my home unit in the School of Biology and Ecology. Uh, it was my first semester and then I headed off to Scarborough Marsh, Maine, where I started to study uh, tidal marshes and the birds that specialize in that type of habitat. Um, I was working as part of a large research collaborative known as the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program. Uh, and prior to this point, I had mostly studied birds by sheer accident. My undergraduate thesis led me to an ornithologist and then I worked a few field jobs, particularly in coastal habitat. So I was very excited to start this work for a species that we thought was threatened. Um, but as you'll see throughout my talk today, um, that research has taken me in some unexpected places uh, that I've been really excited to pursue and uh, underscores the utility and what's so amazing about CCI to be an explicitly interdisciplinary home for climate change research. Um, and before I forget, um, I'm gonna try and keep it short-ish um, because I have class at one um, and I imagine you probably want some time for questions. So uh, I might, wind up skipping some parts for that reason. So I apologize in advance. So anyways, 2011, I'm setting out to study tidal marshes. Wetlands are maligned in our culture. Um, it's all over journey narrative movies, um, but I happen to think they're pretty cool. Um, they are a very interesting ecosystem that is generally, uh, gives us a lot of ecosystem services. Um, this is a picture from Scarborough Marsh in Southern Maine. Uh, First and foremost for my interest is biodiversity. So many, many creatures inhabit tidal marshes um, and a lot of those creatures are specialized just for this extreme habitat. Because it's kind of weird when you think about it, it's terrestrial for part of the day and then it becomes marine for part of the day. So if you're a terrestrial or land-based organism, you have to be able to survive when your habitat becomes flooded with tide water a couple times a day. And if you're a marine organism, you have to be able to survive when it dries out a couple of times a day. Um, so it attracts some really interesting critters um, and lots of them. So if we turn to plants um, and look at the primary productivity of tidal marshes, you can see that it ranks, if you hopefully you can see my cursor over here, higher even than tropical rainforest in terms of net primary productivity per unit area. Um, and that's because uh, the grasses in tidal marshes uh, die from one year to the next and the sediments are very waterlogged. So not a lot of decomposition happens and instead peat builds and it winds up storing that partially decomposed uh, organic material of the plants. And it's actually a big carbon storage sink, um, tidal marshes. <clears throat> Here's a nice graphic that just kind of illustrates what tidal marshes are like. Many of you have probably seen them, um, but they're sort of grasslands at the interface of the land and the ocean. And again, it just makes for really interesting um, plants and animals that inhabit these uh, tidal marsh habitats. This figure shows that tidal marshes, though a really productive ecosystem, are globally rare. Um, so they live life and they produce a lot of plants and animals and they tend to be specialized, but they're found in relatively few places across the planet. Um, but you can see also that here in the eastern coast of North America, we're lucky to have a high concentration of tidal marshes relative to the rest of the world. And this figure also shows um, rates of endemism among uh, 
species that live in tidal marshes. So endemic means that it's only found in that place, in this case, tidal marsh habitat. And so you can see that um, there are a number of species and subspecies that are explicitly or only found in tidal marshes. And again, that's particularly concentrated here in North America. So what we do with our tidal marshes here on the eastern coast of the US really matters for global conservation of these habitats. <clears throat> And I set out in 2011 to study birds that live in tidal marshes because we had strong reason to suspect that they were not doing well for reasons I'll get into momentarily. The first and foremost among them was the salt marsh sparrow, a little brown bird that you've been hearing about from me for 10 years now, as well as others. Um, but I realized that you probably haven't heard about the results of this large coordinated effort that I started working with years ago. And so I'm gonna go over some of the highlights of what we found over the past decade in studying salt marsh sparrows. Um, so they're these little brown birds um, that you can see here. They run much more than they walk. They're kind of like little mice scurrying around in the grasses of tidal marshes. They breed only between Maine and Virginia. Uh, so again, what we do with tidal marshes in this region and for this species really matters now for preserving global biodiversity. The salt marsh sparrows breed only in the Northeast region here. <clears throat> Unfortunately for salt marsh sparrows, as well as other wildlife that are endemic to tidal marshes, and, and salt marsh sparrows, by the way, live in tidal marshes for their entire annual cycle. So they're 100% reliant upon tidal marshes as a habitat. But unfortunately, tidal marshes are on the front lines of climate change for obvious reasons, because sea level rise is creeping upward and is taking these grasslands at the interface of the ocean and flooding them more and more frequently. What that looks like for the salt marsh sparrow is this. So this figure from the main office of GIS shows high marsh habitat, which floods about once a month in this region. Um, in light blue and then low marsh habitat in darker blue. So that's the area of the marsh that floods at the twice daily high tides, whereas the high marsh floods once a month at the astronomical high tide. And salt marsh sparrows nest up in the high marsh. So these stars are places where I found nests in this first few years of field work starting in 2011. So what that looks like um, in profile view is this. So the low marsh is over here that floods twice a day. Tidal, uh, salt marsh sparrows live up in the high marsh, the area that floods about once a month, <clears throat> the high marsh plain, if you will, as you probably heard Joe Kelly and Dan Milnett talk about a lot. And they build their nests just a few inches off the ground in the grasses that are here in the high marsh habitat. Um, so sea level rise is a big problem for tidal uh, salt marsh sparrows. This is what it looks like, a real nest from Scarborough Marsh. <clears throat> and this is kind of a weird behavior for a terrestrial bird like salt marsh sparrows. Um, high marshes are always flooding pretty frequently, once a month or more often at high tide events. And so salt marsh sparrows, however, are uniquely adapted to be able to fit their entire nesting cycle in between the astronomical high tides once a month about. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of variation High tide on one day is not the same as high tide on another day. So during this once a month highest high tide, um, in between those events is when salt marsh sparrows can successfully breed. They can get everything done in less than a month. So they can go from a female with no nest to building the nest, soliciting copulation, uh, laying the eggs, incubating the eggs, feeding the chicks, and the chicks getting ready to leave the nest in less than 28 days between those monthly high tide events, which is crazy. And I haven't even mentioned also salt marsh sparrows, there's no um, pair bonds. The males don't contribute to any of that. This is all the females who are getting all of that done in the highly productive salt marsh habitat because there's many, many insects and just high productivity. Um, so this shows how they can fit everything between those monthly high tide events if all goes well. However, if a storm comes in, uh, they unfortunately can be in big trouble. So this is overnight footage of a salt marsh sparrow nest. You can see here's the nest hole that's woven by the female, and then it's embedded in the grasses. And you can even see four little eggs here. So this is taken over, I believe, about two hours um, around the monthly high tide. Um, so I'll just let you watch that. So you can see that the high tide has come up where it's actually making the eggs float 
in the nest bowl. <clears throat> Again, this is not your usual for what happens to terrestrial birds. And then do you see what happened at the end? The female came back and started incubating the eggs again. We've actually found that they can, um, the eggs can survive up to about nine different flooding events with cold, um, salty water, as long as the female comes back and incubates them. So for this species, it's really critical that the eggs just don't float out of the nest bowl because then the female won't incubate them anymore. So this is what they're adapted to. Um, and they have really neat adaptations like persisting and incubating after their eggs have been flooded. Um, however, we're just increasing the flooding rate, the sea level rise. Um, this figure shows how that really cool natural history winds up shaping patterns of nesting that we see. So on the x-axis, we have time throughout the breeding season starting in June and going on to the end of August. Each horizontal line represents a nest. The line starts when we found the nest and ends when the nest was completed, either through failure in gray lines or successful fledging of chicks leaving the nest in green lines. And so you can see here that there's clearly these pulses of nesting and that is dictated by the high tides. So these red bars are when those monthly high tide events came through. So uh, this weird landscape of the tidal marsh and the uncommon constraints of it um, have really shaped their breeding ecology. It also has shaped their uh, evolution and their breeding strategy. So salt marsh sparrows have been named as the world's most promiscuous bird species because when we looked at it in Connecticut, in one third of the nest, every egg or chick had a different father. Uh, again, there's no pair bonds between the males and the females. The females do all the work and the males fly around trying to mate with other females. Um, and again, this is probably shaped by nesting in tidal marshes. For the female to nest successfully, she's got to be able to re-nest quickly. So she's just got to find a mate fast. Um, and so in that case, it's, it's a good thing that there's all these males flying around looking for females to mate with. Um, I hope that I've given you an appreciation for this species. It's a really neat ecology. It's uh, just a great little packet of genetic biodiversity wrapped up in a little brown bird. So that we're really concerned that sea level rise is taking this really cool system and disrupting it um, by making the window between monthly high tide events when that high marsh habitat where their nests are is not flooded shorter and shorter. Um, returning to the Scarborough Marsh example with the high marsh shown in light blue, and the low marsh shown in darker blue. We've got the nest here where there are red stars. And this is what the high versus low marsh ratio looks like now. And this is what it would look like under two meters of sea level rise. So as you can see, the nest areas are now in low marsh habitat where they're flooded twice a day. And salt marsh sparrows are incredible and have this really cool breeding system, but they can't nest that fast. Um, in this diagram, the high marsh is even potential high marsh, but if you look closely, you can see that there are houses and forest back here. So it's not likely to transition to high marsh uh, very easily. So we were worried about salt marsh sparrows. This is a, a young bird climbing up out of the nest. You can see a little temperature sensor in the nest here. Um, they do have this incredible adaptation where the chicks can scramble up into the grasses and stay above the high water um, if they're big enough. Um, but again, that window just is getting shorter and shorter um, with sea level rise. And so because we suspected that sea level rise was a problem for salt marsh sparrows, uh, it's been named as a species of concern by the Audubon Society, um, IUCN Red List. However, there was very little that was actually known about salt marsh sparrows because tidal marshes aren't readily surveyed in, well, they're just hard to muck around in. We saw all those depictions from movies. And, and it was a big data gap um, as of 2011. And so a group of scientists banded together to form the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program to investigate salt marsh sparrows and other tidal marsh birds. Um, so this is the effort that I joined as a graduate student in 2011. And one of the initial PIs was Brian Olson, my PhD advisor, who was one of the founding members of the SHARP project. However, we also included as part of this project, nonprofits, um, government agencies at the federal, state, and local level. 
it's been a huge team um, that has worked over the last decade continuously to first and foremost, get data on salt marsh sparrows and other bird species shown here that are dependent upon tidal marshes for which not a lot was known. So we wanted to find out, okay, first, what are the population sizes? Where are they found on the landscape of tidal marshes? What are their population trends? We were lucky to have comprehensive surveys done 10 years prior, um, so around 1999 to 2001 that we could compare to, to look at the population trends over time. Uh, and then dive into their demographics. Um, so look at their nest survival um, and their reproductive success. Look at the survival of the adults, put those together into a population viability model um, to see whether the population is on the whole growing or shrinking and at what rate. <clears throat> so salt marsh sparrows are shown here, but we had a number of other species that are also reliant upon tidal marshes to varying degrees that we included in these surveys as well. So the SHARP project has two main arms and they all kicked off in 2011. So the first one are range-wide point count surveys. So you can see all of these little white points are spots in the marsh where we would have observers walk out to and observe all of the species that they could see or hear within different distance bands. And this work at UMaine was largely led by my lab mate Mo Corral shown here. <clears throat> so we randomly selected points across the marsh. We used a standardized monitoring protocol um, for those point counts so that we could compare it to other data sets. And we implemented this at 17, over 1,700 locations in 2011 and then again in 2012. So this is where you go to many, many places three times across the breeding season and count all the species that you see or hear. And from, and then the other arm of the SHARP project is region-wide demographic surveys. So that's where we're going to a few places day in, day out. We're finding nests, we're tracking them to see if they succeed or fail over time. We're capturing individuals. You can see this little one's got leg bands so that we know who it is. Um, we're recapturing them to estimate their survival. Um, so these are boots on the ground in the same places over and over again to uh, look at their populations in detail and figure out what's their reproductive success, how long are the birds surviving for, if nests fail, is it due to flooding or is it due to something else? <clears throat> and for this part of the survey, we covered about 550 kilometers with our um, intensive demographic plots, uh, of which there are about 23. We've gotten over 25,000 captures of I think maybe about 10,000 individuals. We found about 10,000 nests, 3,000 of which are the salt marsh sparrows. So we've accumulated a lot of data over the last 10 years on the species that as of 2011, we just didn't really know a lot about its populations and how they were doing. We just had a strong suspicion that it wasn't well. Um, so, some of the results that have come out of this tremendous amount of effort we've done over the last 10 years are first and foremost, their population sizes. Um, so I've shown them for each of our focal species down here, but the salt marsh sparrows um, in particular, we estimated were about 53,000 as of 2011, 2012. And when we compared that to the data from 10 years prior around 2000, we found that they were declining at a rate of 9% annually. To put that in perspective, at about 2,000, that would be over 200,000 individuals. And then in 2011-12, 53,000 individuals. So these are big declines that we're seeing for salt marsh sparrows. Um, some of the other species were not declining significantly, though. Um, so that some good news wrapped in there. And when we looked at um, the different species that use the tidal marshes, what we found are the ones that were most reliant upon tidal marshes like salt marsh sparrows that live in them year round, that's, those are the species that were doing the worst and had the sharpest declines. Whereas species like the willet, which use tidal marshes sometimes, some of their populations do, and, and they use it for part of the year, but not necessarily all of the year, were not declining. So the more reliant on the tidal marsh a bird species is, the worse its populations have been faring. We dug into this a little deeper. Um, we found that even though salt marsh sparrows are declining at a rate of 9% per year across the range, um, if you look at individual points, 
where a tidal marsh has no restrictions, no culverts or roads crossing it, they're actually stable. And it's at points where they are, the marsh is affected by multiple tidal restrictions where the population decline is the worst. So this is already pointing to some helpful insights for aiding conservation efforts. The undisturbed marshes hydrologically are doing much better in terms of the populations than those that are affected by tidal restrictions. And when we dug into the demographics and put together population viability analyses, um, we found that most of the populations are not stable. Most are declining. At those demographic plots where we were studying populations intensively, uh, very few of them were not declining. Uh, and really it boiled down to the reproductive success. Um, so it's just not high enough. It is very variable across the range. So you can have sites that are kind of next door to each other um, that have very different reproductive success. Um, and again, that points to some management recommendations like tidal restrictions. Um, but just on the whole, we're seeing that, yeah, as we suspected, sea level rise is just shortening this window. And when you put it together and projecting it into the future, we are expecting that reproduction is basically going to reach zero around 2060. Um, and that's when the population will be functionally extinct. Um, so unfortunate news for the salt marsh pharaoh. Um, and the story was not so grim for some of the other tidal marsh specialists that we were looking at. But these are all pieces of the puzzle that we put together. Um, after a lot of effort, again, visiting over 1700 points three times in a season for multiple years, visiting some of the demographic plots every three days, um, all throughout the breeding season. Uh, and though the news wasn't good, we were feeling um, grateful that we had met our goals of figuring out, okay, how are these populations doing? Um, however, in the midst of this uh, project, a natural experiment presented itself. So after two years of data collection, Hurricane Sandy came through our study area and caused tremendous damage to tidal marshes and other coastal ecosystems, as well as human infrastructure found on the coast. And it actually cut right through our study system where we had already collected two years of baseline data. So that set us up for sort of an ideal before after control impact study where we could again look at these tidal marsh bird populations, but in light of disturbance from this hurricane. Um, and so we were then looking to characterize how negative was the hurricane for tidal marsh bird populations. And so we basically just revisited these original metrics, but in that before after control impact um, context. And what we found there was a little surprising. So when you look at the various, um, predictive variables uh, and the response of, um, this is high to low marsh ratio. So how much um, a high marsh habitat that salt marsh sparrows need is losing ground to the low marsh, which is just flooded too frequently for them to nest in. And what we found is that the storm surge was not a significant predictor of that habitat loss, sea level rise. So it was the chronic stressor of sea level rise that uh, is causing high marsh to lose ground to low marsh in our study area, not this huge, huge magnitude um, storm, but instead it's the chronic stressor of sea level rise. And we actually found that there wasn't any evidence that bird populations were affected by the um, Hurricane Sandy storm surge. So even though marshes up and down the coast were remodeled, there were um, you know, new channels that were blown through, tons of sand thrown up on the marsh, they didn't appear to respond negatively or at all to um, areas that were impacted by the storm. Looking at the reproductive success, for example, and this is work that I was doing as a postdoc at the University of Connecticut after I finished my PhD here. Um, there's no difference between before the storm versus after the storm across many species, including salt marsh sparrows. So here are the post storm years and you can see they're well within the range of variation observed pre Sandy. And in fact, the worst year here was just a very heavy rain year um, where the marsh just really didn't dry out and it was just a persistently raiding breeding season. <clears throat> so following in the wake of Sandy, there also has been increased investment in tidal marsh restoration because people recognized that 
Tidal marshes are important because they protect our shorelines and the human infrastructure associated with them. Actually, during my post talk, when I was coming up with this result that uh, bird reproduction was not negatively impacted by Hurricane Stan Sandy coming through, I decided I was going to compare it to um, coastal real estate values because there's so much damage incurred by Hurricane Sandy. I thought, well, obviously property values will have taken a hit and they'll show a big decrease following Sandy. It is actually the opposite. And apparently this pattern is pretty widespread because when uh, it's pretty common that when a house is mown down by a hurricane, people just build a more expensive, higher property value uh, home right where the old one just got flooded. And so that was a surprise to me. Um, but at least from our federal partners, we are seeing a big investment in protecting tidal marshes because they protect our infrastructure. So there's a lot of restoration efforts that were funded by um, congressionally allocated post-Sandy recovery funding. Uh, things like adding sediment on top of the marsh to help it grow vertically and accrete, plantings, uh, replacing undersized culverts. And these projects uh, targeting tidal marsh restoration span the region, um, particularly the impact zone for Hurricane Sandy. And we were again fortunate to have some baseline data before Handy, uh, Sandy hit. So we're currently funded and through 2023 to analyze the efficacy of these restoration projects that are planned up and down the coast uh, using both bird data and vegetation data, comparing what we're seeing now post-restoration to what we had in our baseline pre-Sandy data set. We don't have results for that yet because these restoration projects are ongoing. Um, some of them haven't even started a, is often delayed um, when you're talking big construction and restoration projects, but we're continuing to work on that through 2024, most likely. And we're looking forward to being able to give recommendations for what types of restoration techniques are working for the vegetation and the tidal marsh bird populations. In the meantime, we have already identified areas of best habitat to be protected. So I mentioned earlier, when we look at the reproductive success, you can see there's really high variation at spots that are really close to each other. So these are all in Scarborough Marsh and all less than four kilometers from each other. I'll just zoom in a little here. And this site, Jones Creek, has much higher reproductive success than the other one. That's surprising because it's actually behind a really um, severe tidal restriction. So we've had some unexpected insights in terms of what habitats are good for the birds and worth protecting. This site, you wouldn't think it would be good for the birds. It's very wet, soggy, smells terrible. Um, it is a big birding uh, hotspot, but you would not look at it and think it was prime salt marsh sparrow habitat, but they seem, well, we know they're doing really well there. And so it's a site that's been added to just keep as is and protect because of the insights we've gathered from taking a deep dive into the demographics of these species over the last 10 years. We've also branched out to various management um, techniques. Bree Benvenuti, who is a grad student on the project and now works for Rachel Kirsten National Wildlife Refuge, has experimented with building these floating islands of tidal marsh and planting them so that basically they're just kind of anchored to the bottom of a pool so that when the tide comes up, they'll rise with the tide so that they won't flood. Um, and she's gotten the plantings going well. This is just one example. We are actively soliciting any and all harebrained ideas, anything that we can test to try and come up with some management strategies that will help salt marsh sparrows. It's clear that they're in trouble. They're expected to be extinct before the end of the century, halfway through the century. Um, and so we're very actively trying to figure out ideas and test everything to hand managers some useful tools to protect uh, this species and the other tidal marsh birds that are threatened. Um, but that brings me to sort of the end of my postdoc, although I have alluded to work here that's ongoing. Um, and I'm still part of this project at CoPI now. Um, so we're continuing to work hard um, to assess these populations. Um, but I wanted to talk about some other work that I've done um, that it won't sound like it's all related, but it is. Um, so my my general goal kind of at heart is just to preserve our ecosystems and the biodiversity that they live or that live there to figure out how they work and how we can keep them going 
in the face of environmental change caused by humans. Um, so when I started as a faculty member here, lecturer in ecology and environmental sciences in 2016, uh, one course that I was assigned is EES 217, Field Research in Ecology and Environmental Sciences. The goal of this course very broadly is just to get students out in the field, usually for the first time. We go to Acadia typically um, and get them to engage in a research project for the first time for most of them on a short timeline, 48 or 72 hours. And we want them to work on a stakeholder, a question that matters to stakeholders. And we want them to be self-directed and engage in the discovery process of figuring out how to do science in the real world. That was kind of the, the goals that were outlined to me when I started. And it's really been a, uh, a blank canvas to get to engage with some really exciting work and build this course um, over the last few years. So where I've wound up taking it is bringing students to Acadia National Park for 48 or 72 hours. I've got one coming up this weekend and assigning them groups. All of the groups focus on some broad question that stakeholder co-generated that I hear from my colleagues at National Park Service or the Scudic Institute is important for, to them. And they have to figure out what they're gonna do. How, like, what's their hypothesis? How are they gonna test it? What methods are they gonna use? That all happens on Friday night. And then on Saturday, they go out into the field and collect their data for most of the day. Then they come back into the classroom Saturday afternoon and start to analyze their data. By Sunday afternoon, they're presenting the results of their research to the public. Um, it's not usually a lot of people, but it's enough to make them nervous. And, and the students really rise to the challenge of doing real research. Um, because one of the things I'm most proud of for this class is that I've managed to integrate it with active funded research projects so that the students are collecting real data that's being used and scholarly articles. So one example um, and, and how I got started with that was that uh, in my first year teaching that class, I was asking colleagues at the National Park Service, okay, what questions do you have that we can throw 20 semi-trained scientists on for a couple days? And I heard about the new campground in Scudic. So this is the first campground built in Acadia National Park since the 1930s. And it added 1,400 acres to the park's land holdings. Um, it was an anonymous land donation cloaked in secrecy. And so they did all the development before the land was transferred over to Acadia National Park. They built the campsites, 97 campsites, seven miles of gravel bike paths, a visitor center with a hundred car parking lot. And what I heard from my colleagues was because it was an anonymous donation, they couldn't do any monitoring ahead of time so that they could track what were the pros and cons of developing this area. On the one hand, they have more access for visitors to camp and visit Acadia, and that's a good thing. But on the other hand, they had to cut down trees to build that campground. So how does it all shake out? So we decided to look at the biodiversity through birds and vegetation and carbon storage in the forest and what was removed from storage with the deforestation, and then the economic and recreation and tourism impacts um, by doing a bunch of bird, vegetation, and visitor surveys. <clears throat> This was new territory for me. Um, you know, I got in, or I held, handled the bird side of things and overall project coordination. I wound up taking on more of the human dimension side of things than I had anticipated. Um, my colleague, Aaron Strong, who was a CCI affiliate, moved on to another institution. He was the social scientist on board. Um, but we wound up founding really interesting results. Um, on the bird side of things, we found that the number of species was actually highest near the campground. Um, however, these are species that are, um, are okay with living near humans, so like robins and blue jays. And so it's actually a bit of a, a negative result in terms of conservation, where it's kind of bringing in your kind of park suburban birds, whereas the Scudic Peninsula had formerly been more unique in terms of its avian community. <clears throat> and this work was, the heavy lifting was done by an undergraduate, Allie East, who's now pursuing a master's out in Montana. And we found uh, for the economic and visitor impacts, we found that campers in the new campground were more likely to be first time visitors to Scudic. So the campground was actively bringing in new people. So more opportunities for recreation in the park. And the campground was influential in why they went to Scudic in the first place. 
and they were more likely to spend longer at Sudik and do more recreational activities and more likely to shop locally and support the local economy. In terms of the vegetation, we didn't find any edge effect um, like we did for the birds, but we did estimate the amount of carbon that was removed from storage because of cutting down trees for the campground. It was a lot. However, it pales in comparison to how much was preserved because the developed area was just a small component of the larger parcel that was planted. So when you look at the ecosystem services overall and the benefits that we get from the ecosystem in Acadia um, because of this campground, there were losses on the wildlife habitat and biodiversity side of things, um, gains in terms of recreational opportunities and economic effects, and both positive and negative in terms of carbon storage. Um, so I had, hearing this from colleagues, got a grant from UMaine to investigate this and, and hired a couple of student technicians to collect the data over the summer, but then we basically saved some of the data for the 217 class to collect in the fall. And it was just, such a rich experience for everybody that we've wound up continuing it since and having different research projects for the students to engage with each time. I just found that the stakeholders were really uh, glad to see students collecting data on a project that mattered to them. The students really took seriously the responsibility of collecting real data that was going to be used and, and I think learned more for doing authentic science um, that mattered to stakeholders. So I mentioned that this weekend, I've got another round of EES 217. Um, their public presentation will be on Sunday as usual. This is an old flyer, but it'll be Sunday down at Scudic Institute and we'll have um, a Zoom opportunity as well. This time they're looking at water resources. Unfortunately, I've got a new invasive crab down in Scudic. Uh, we're gonna look at the intertidal and a, a little stream that appears to be more polluted than when we looked at it a couple of years ago. Um, so again, the the question is always changing based on whatever research project um, we have going or the Scudic Institute has going, um, but I really loved this model um, and actually got the opportunity to speak about it at the, um, the National Center for Science and Civic Engagement uh, a few years ago. When I was there, I saw a talk about um, people's science literacy and understanding of basically a word problem where they were shown uh, evidence that included numeric evidence about the efficacy of a, a, a treatment for a rash. And they were given sample data and said, okay, is the rash or is the treatment effective or not? Looking at how many people had the rash still after they had treatment versus those who didn't in the placebo group. Um, so basically there were two versions, one that showed that yes, the treatment was effective and the other one showed that it wasn't. And they did find that generally people who are better with numbers, you know, better at math, were more correct at in correctly interpreting the information that they were given. Um, and so that's to be expected. And when they split it by political party, they found that people similarly um, were, the better they were at math, the more likely they were to get the right answer based on what the data told them. But when you gave them a different, same data, same numbers, um, same contingency table, but instead the scenario was about gun control and legislation to decrease gun violence, it was a different result. Um, and now how well you correctly interpreted the data depended on your political affiliation. And then even more, if you look at the gap, so in blue, we have um, liberal Democrats here. So you can see that they're more likely to get the right answer based on the data that they're given if it aligns with their ideology. Um, and they were less likely to get it right if it was not aligning with their ideology. So crime increased after, that there, after there was a gun ban. And then an even more interesting thing is that this gap between the people who get it right and get it wrong because it conflicts with their ideology is wider for the people who understand numbers better and are better at math. So this is a talk I heard while I was down at that conference. And this was a real aha moment for me, I think. It, it, well, it does, it makes sense. It's things that you probably internalize that when it comes to choosing between your head or your heart, protecting your identity and your ideology, people often will go for what protects their kind of worldview as opposed to what the data and the numbers are telling them. People who are better with numbers have more capacity to kind of twist and, you know, do some numerical acrobatics to convince themselves that, that they're true, uh, what they feel is true is true. Um, 
but it really got me excited about trying to dive into this and understand more um, about how people understand science. Um, and one of the other studies I read about too was that, yeah, people are more likely to confirm the right, you know, what the evidence tells them if it aligns with their ideology. Um, if they are, you know, there's that gap in terms of scientific intelligence or numeric intelligence and how, how strong your capacity is with science or numbers. But that pattern does not hold true if you just characterize how science curious people are. So not how science literate, but just how excited about science they are. So I think this is a really heartening result from a body of work that really got me thinking about how to protect our ecosystems and how to get people to make decisions that are gonna protect our ecosystems. Because if we can just get people excited about science, maybe that has a stronger effect than if we educate them about science literacy. And I'm not advocating that we abandon science literacy attempts by any means, but I'm just um, excited that there's a way forward potentially to get people who might not be science majors um, or scientists professionally, but instead just excited about science to get on board with accepting the evidence that they're uh, presented with and making decisions accordingly. So I started to do some research on my classes. I teach a big gen ed, 150 students in the spring. And in coordination with Ashley Landrum, who did a lot of this preliminary work, we started to test my students and use them as a sample size to characterize their science um, curiosity and test whether that could be improved based on assignments that I uh, gave them in class with the uh, hope of just getting them excited about science. That work's still underway. We don't have results at the moment, but um, I'm really excited to see results. And I, I'm just really excited to think, uh, continue to grow my research program in terms of uh, leveraging what we're learning about how people understand science and feel about science to make decisions on uh, in our environment and how we protect our natural resources. So it was uh, a lucky thing that these stars all aligned, you know, starting to get into the human dimensions of scientific research and studying people um, with this experiential learning class that I've been teaching for the last five years with my underlying desire to just conserve our ecosystems moving forward. Um, my 217 class is kind of, uh, I like to think of a poster child for what we now are calling research learning experiences here at UMaine. And so now we've got this big push funded by the Alfond Foundation to bring research learning experiences to a much wider swath of the undergrad population here at UMaine. Um, and, and there's a very robust assessment effort that I'm involved with as part of um, this program where we're going to be asking questions like, what is it about experiential learning that would increase STEM learning and those positive outcomes in terms of how people understand science, um, but also their sense of belonging within science and ultimately their retention. How excited are they about science? How likely are they to continue to be a science major or make science-informed decisions um, after they graduate? And how can we take this pool of experiential learning that I know I believe is really effective for my experiences with EES 217, and how do we reach all students by scaling up across the UMaine system? So again, this is part of the UMS Transforms grant, which is funded largely by the Alphonse Foundation. And I want to mention my new PhD student, Holly White, is doing truly the heavy lifting on this front. Many of you have probably heard from her as she was distributing surveys this fall. So we're in the first year of pilot data collection with the first year of the research learning experiences, RLEs. And we've got, you know, over 500 responses for, I think, just the comparison group and then over 250 for the research learning experience students that we'll be comparing and Holly will be answering some of these questions. So again, I'm really excited to put these things together and, and, and use what we can learn about how people feel about science and learn and decide to stay scientists and stay science informed and science curious and apply that to conserving our ecosystem. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying um, it's been a, a maybe not circuitous but branching path for me in terms of research. Um, I I'm investigating things that I would not have expected when I started here at UMaine and CCI in 2011. Um, it's taken me many paces I didn't expect, 
through Mongolia. Um, and I like this picture because it shows the first glacier I got to see up close in the background. And then here I am trying to find petroglyphs on a rock and I didn't know what I was looking at. I love that CCI is very explicitly interdisciplinary and I'm clearly on the ecological side of things, but my time as a graduate student, I really was, my interest was sparked by hearing from the, the rocks and ice people and the um, archeology span and human culture people. And I found it to be a really rich environment for, for sparking curiosity and, and it feeling within reach to, to try new things research-wise. So I look forward to hopefully becoming affiliated again, officially as faculty um, and continuing that um, trajectory of, of you know, learning from everyone else here within CCI. So I'll wrap up by thanking funding sources so many, too many to show here, but um, these are our predominant funders for the work that I've described here. Just within the salt marsh habitat, there are a lot of people involved and I'm presenting a lot of the just kind of wrap up 10 years later results um, across a very large effort. Um, these were just my texts from one or no, three of the 23 plots. So you can, you can get the sense that it's really an army of people who've been doing all of this work um, and I thank them all. Um, thank you all for listening, and I welcome any questions you have for the last few minutes. Thanks. Is that a question, Dan? Yeah, quite, well, I'll start. I'll, I'll say it's a good thing that I, I'm not going to do a punning summary because I would otherwise have had to say that your research on the salt marsh sparrows is for the birds. And I would have probably <laughs> winged it from there, egged on by people's muted groans. In terms of science education, it does sound as though you're advocating for an Alice in Wonderland approach. You want people to be curiouser and curiouser. And finally, I would have noted that at the very end, you made a good point that in an interdisciplinary world, one's research path isn't carved in stone. <laughs> but I also, have, I also have a real question for you. <laughs> what happened to the tidal marshes and the salt marsh sparrows as sea level changed during the deglaciation and rebound? It seems to me that there's a long-term major experiment and they didn't go extinct. So what's, I mean, you, I think you gave some clues in your talk, but what is, what's uh, going on there? We're getting into wild speculation on my part, because unfortunately birds don't leave very good fossils, hollow bones, and, and they only differ in terms of plumage um, from each other's species. So, and then as you've heard from Joe Kelly, it's hard to find an old salt marsh. You know, you've got to go down to take wild guesses and find evidence in the stratigraphic record. But from grilling people like Joe Kelly and Dale Belknap a number of years ago, you know, my understanding is salt marshes, they're geologically ephemeral, they move, there have been times where they've been very restrictive and then more expansive, and we're in an expansive time at the moment. Um, so I think that they didn't always live in strictly salt marshes. And I think that they hybridized with the sister species that currently still nests in grasslands and that they were kind of like going in and out. Um, but unfortunately that doesn't help us now because they don't nest anywhere except salt marshes. So you'd think that if it were in their evolutionary memory, they would, but they just don't. And, and that might in part be because there's few enough of them now, habitat is not limiting. And, and it's unfortunate where they just, they have a strong habitat filter to nest in tidal marshes and it's just not good for them at this point. Do you think they have a residual genetic adaptation to these other modes of living and reproducing so that they, some might go back and survive? Yeah, I mean, we'd be talking, yeah, I, I think it might be possible. And I think their sister species that they hybridize with, you know, they, they have a lot of the same genes and so, even if the salt marsh sparrows go extinct, some of their genetic material will be harbored in their sister species that hopefully will survive for longer. Um, so there's, there's that to hope for. Um, but I think, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know what, why they might have, how they might have switched modes in the past and why they wouldn't now or what it would take. And again, this is really the, the realm of wild speculation on my part. I wish I knew, um, and I, I wish we could take action on that front. So I thought you were gonna say that, that it's human presence and, and you, know, you gave some evidence that where humans have messed up with the, the expansion of the tidal marshes that they're not doing well and where people have stayed out, 
they're doing better. Maybe without people, tidal marshes just keep moving up and in. We have done a little work on that in recent years. Oh, I think that's almost okay. Yeah, looking at how much tidal marsh is gaining on the upland because um, it's losing on the marine edge, uh, and it's it's kind of contentious. At this point, there are some people who say, "Oh, yeah, marsh migration is happening. It's fine." Um, the evidence we've looked at shows no, um, because especially here in Maine, the profile is such where it's not low enough that marsh can easily take over. And, hmm. and it's just kind of hard, real, kind of hard to kill a tree. <laughs> um, and we've seen the trees on the edge are actually growing pretty well um, because they don't compete for light as much. Again, this is the jury's out on this and there are people in other places who disagree and say that marsh migration is happening into the upland. <laughs> for humans, people don't want their yard or their, their yard to become marsh or their basement um, flooded. And in the Northeast, that's a lot of what we're dealing with in terms of upland edge is human development. And people will just build seawalls. Thank you. Are there other questions? Oh, seeing none. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. I, I had even more questions, but um, I'll save them for the next time. Thanks, Dan. And I got to run to class. So that, that's right. great. I know Thank you. I look forward to talking. Great. Take care.